Well, good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues, and thank you for joining the Law Library of Congress and the United States Supreme Court for the 2024 Supreme Court Fellows Program Lecture. My name is Aslihan Bulut, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Law Librarian of Congress. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to send greetings from the beautiful Coolidge Auditorium of the Library of Congress's Jefferson Building to both our in-person audience and all of you watching us online. Let me just say a couple of words about the Law Library of Congress. The Law Library serves as a custodian of legal and legislative collection of nearly three million items from all countries and legal systems around the world. Our skilled staff of attorneys and law librarians provide research assistance and reference services on United States federal and state legal issues. Our foreign law specialists are a diverse group of foreign trained attorneys who provide foreign comparative and international law research and analysis to all three branches of government. Our team is responsible for developing the collection for more than 300 legal systems, including foreign and international jurisdictions, as well as the US states and territories in all formats. Each month, the Law Library hosts free webinars on topics covering US, foreign, and international and comparative law, and we invite you to sign up for these webinars on our website, law.gov. We are so honored today to have the U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice, Honorable Elena Kagan at the Library of Congress. I want to mention that our manuscripts division contains papers of many Supreme Court justices, and the Law Library of Congress is a proud repository of the Supreme Court Records and Briefs collection. So after the event today, we hope that you will return to explore these wonderful collections. And at this time, I would like to ask that you please silence your phones and I'd also please ask the, to refrain from taking any audio or uh, video recordings or photos of the event. And with that, I'd like to introduce the counselor to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Judge Robert M. Dow, Jr. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Aslihan, and I, uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Hayden and the, everyone here at the Library of Congress for hosting the 2024 Supreme Court Fellows Program Lecture. I am honored to welcome you here today in my dual roles as Counselor to the Chief Justice and Executive Director of the Supreme Court Fellows Program. The Fellows Program celebrates its 51st year, and I am pleased to tell our audience a little bit more about it today. The Fellows Program offers mid-career professionals, recent law school graduates, and doctoral degree holders from the law and political science fields an opportunity to broaden their understanding of the judicial system through exposure to federal court administration. The Supreme Court Fellows Commission selects four talented individuals to work for one of four federal judicial agencies for a year-long appointment here in Washington, D.C. Those agencies are the Supreme Court of the United States, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, the Federal Judicial Center, and the U.S. Sentencing Commission. All fellows gain practical experience in judicial administration, policy development, and education. They also benefit from time to study and write, and from a vantage point uh, in which they can develop an academic research agenda as well. Uh, it's so wonderful to see so many of our fellows alumni. I saw some of you on the walkover. Uh, in, in the audience today and also the finalists for our 2024-25 Fellows class. Every class of Fellows is special, but the, this year's class, I want to tell you, is composed of exceptional individuals who are talented lawyers and good-hearted humans. And I see them walking all the time uh, into our building. I sometimes even encounter them over at the administrative office. And uh, I will say my, my phrase for them is all for one and one for all. They are so supportive of each other and they've also uh, adopted what we call in the counselor's office our mantra, which is other duties is assigned. <laughs> because there are many times in which uh, w working for any of those agencies, but I think particularly over at the Supreme Court, you never know what each day is going to bring. And this class of fellows has been wonderful in pitching in wherever they're needed. So let me just tell you a little bit about each of them. Adam Kugler is the fellow assigned to the Federal Judicial Center. 
the Education and Research Agency for the Federal Courts. Adam joined the, federal, uh, the Fellows Program from the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut, where he clerked for the Honorable Sorella Nagala. Uh, I know Adam's future boss is sitting right in front of me here. I just saw him. There he is. Uh, there, oh, they're both there. All right, they're right. They're the, believe me, the bright lights are here. It's hard to pick anybody out, but uh, uh, Adam's future boss is Judge Bill Nardini. He's sitting right in front of me in the Second Circuit. So, Adam, you've got a good home to go to when you leave us. Uh, Adam earned a BA in political science and a JD, both with honors from the University of Connecticut, where he was the managing editor of the Connecticut Law Review. Uh, the fellow assigned to the Supreme Court and the counselor's office is Tori Nickel, uh, and she joined the fellows program from private practice in Missoula, Montana. Uh, she previously clerked for Judge Sid Thomas of the Ninth Circuit and Judge Don Malloy of the U.S. District Court for the District of Montana, which, believe it or not, is one district. Uh, Tori earned her BA, summa cum laude, in political science from Carroll College and a JD with high honors from the University of Montana School of Law where she was co-editor-in-chief of the Montana Law Review. And Tori has truly mastered other duties as assigned. Uh, our next uh, fellow is Viviana Vasiu. She's the fellow assigned to the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which is the agency responsible for the establishment of sentencing policies and practices for the U.S. courts. Viviana joined the Fellows Program from the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, where she clerked for Judge Gregory Woods. She previously clerked for Judge Anthony Porcelli of the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Florida. Viviana was a participant in the Attorney General's Honors Program at the U.S. Department of Justice, serving as a trial lawyer in the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section of the Criminal Division, so if you have a problem in that area, she's your person. <laughs> She earned a BA summa cum laude and a JD magna cum laude from Stetson University where she served as editor-in-chief of the Stetson Law Review. Our fourth fellow is Jose Vasquez who's assigned to the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, uh, the Central Support Agency for the Judicial Branch. Jose joined the Fellows Program from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit where he clerked for Judge Edelberto Jordan. He previously clerked for Judge Jacqueline Becerra of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. Jose earned his B.A. in government from Georgetown and his J.D. from the University of Miami Law School. Both degrees earned magna cum laude. So we have four really smart fellows. Uh, Adam, Tori, Viviana, Jose, you all have been a joy and we're happy to say that your, ex your experience is only half over. Um, so we will look forward to seeing what you accomplish in the remainder of your term. I now have the joy also of introducing our two guests for today for your lecture. Uh, Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton has served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit since 2003 and has been its chief judge since 2021. He's a current member of the Executive Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States and most pertinent to today's events, he is the chair of the Supreme Court Fellows Commission. Previously, Chief Judge Sutton has chaired the Committee on the Rules of Practice and Procedure and the Advisory Committee on appellate rules. Uh, he's an academic too, having taught at The Ohio State University College of Law since 1993 and also at Harvard Law School. He's best known in the academic world for his work on federalism and his casebook on state constitutional law. Uh, Chief Judge Sutton, clerk for Judge Thomas Meskell of the Second Circuit and Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Elena Kagan has served on the Supreme Court of the United States since 2010. Prior to her appointment to the court, she was the Solicitor General of the United States, the federal government's top appellate lawyer, sometimes referred to as the 10th Justice. Prior to that, Justice Kagan was the very popular and successful Dean Kagan of the Harvard Law School. Uh, she had previously been a law professor both at Harvard and at the University of Chicago. She served in the Clinton administration as Associate Counsel and as Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy. Justice Kagan, clerk for Judge Abner Mikva on the D.C. Circuit, and for Justice Thurgood Marshall. Please join me in welcoming two of my favorite people on the planet for what I'm sure will be a fun and far-ranging conversation. You can see me, I can't see you, boy. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Dow. Um, so another slow day at the office. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want everyone to know. Uh, everybody's laughing, so they must know what I did this morning. No, I think they see the irony that this is the big part of the day. Uh, <laughs> 
I was kind of thinking the opposite. It would be impossible to make any news today because everybody would be focused on the morning, which I think, you know, that's, that's good. I'm going to see what I can do. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, w I will point out that the Fellows Commission set this date long ago in the fall. <laughs> and uh, it, it you, you know that because if they hadn't, I would have said no. Well, <laughs> and um, it says so much about you that you agreed. That I didn't you. cancel immediately? It, it, th that, that is exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. And uh, so anyway, and it, it's, just, it's an honor to be with you anyway, but today in particular. So thank you. Really appreciate it. So um, I'm so uh, I'm thrilled to be doing this. The, um, so your father was a um, lawyer, your mother was a teacher, you did both. And I was a lawyer and a teacher. So you did, yeah, so this was easy to understand, uh, so they had a big impact on your career choices, but were there any other teachers or coaches that had an influence on you? I think constantly, I mean, I think every place I've been, I've had great mentors or, you know, and um, I don't think, I think this is true of most people, right, you, 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 you don't, uh, you people help you along the way. And people help you a lot along the way. And, and um, I've been really lucky every place I've been. I've had people who have looked out for me. So I guess I'm a little bit reluctant to name names because yeah. I'm, I'm afraid I'll, I'll, I'll miss people. Because, you know, truly, every uh, I've had a lot of jobs. Used to be that um, before I got this job, sometimes people would introduce me in the way Bob introduced me. And it would be so clear that I would change my jobs every four years. <laughs> that I would say, well, now you know the secret about me, I can't keep a job. <laughs> uh, but every, every place, you know, there was, there was somebody that I could look to for advice and support and counsel. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think you can uh, do stuff unless that's true. All right, well, I'm, I'm not gonna let you get away you with that entirely. You have a particular entirely. person? Uh, I, I do, but uh, you're gonna have to save those questions till we're done. Uh, <laughs> but how about your writing? I think everybody here would love to know who might have been some of the influences on your writing? Uh, well, my, the first influence on my writing was my mother. So my mother was an elementary school teacher, and this was something that um, she thought about, was how to, how to teach young people, and, and um, she cared a lot about good writing. And you, um, so that was my first influence, was that uh, she, she, I think, taught me to write. I think the second person, I'll, I will name names for this one, because I think there are uh, two people who, um, are a, a, a little bit uh, head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of writing. Uh, the second person was um, my senior thesis advisor. I went to Princeton, you had to do a big paper your senior year, and um, I was a history major, and I had uh, really the extraordinary opportunity of um, working with a, a very young professor at the time, who is not so young anymore, uh, but um, uh, Sean Wilentz at Princeton. Ah, yes. And I did um, my junior paper with him and my senior thesis, and he literally went over every page of both multiple times and, um, and taught me better ways of writing. And uh, you know, I learned an extraordinary amount from him you know, about being a, 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 a good historian, I guess, for that time. But the stuff that uh, really, really has made a difference in my life is I came out of that experience um, a much better writer than I went into it. Mm -hmm. So, and now shifting a little bit to court opinions, when you think of your writing, you're obviously trying to explain um, why you're doing what you're doing, but do you have an audience in mind when you're writing? I do, um, and, and I don't know if this really makes sense, because some of the opinions I write, probably the only people who read them are, you know, the lawyers in the case, and maybe um, some set of lawyers who specialize in the subject matter. Try being a court of appeals judge. <laughs> it's, it's worse. Yeah, but I, I try to not think about that. I try to not think about, oh, the only people who are going to read this opinion are, are specialized lawyers. I really try to write so that um, interested Americans can figure out what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. And uh, you know, you try not to dumb it down too much, so there's a, there's a, 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 you, there's a balance you have to strike because you don't want to dumb it down. You want to be, in terms of the substance, um, sophisticated and, um, and, and uh, you, you know, to, to, to treat difficult things as though they're difficult things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I guess what I would like is um, that it, sh it should be the case that even you know, if they don't understand every in and out, 
that an interested person with you know some amount of, you know I guess I think of myself as like uh, writing for you know new serious newspaper readers or something like that um, you know um, uh, that they should be able to pick it up and sort of get the gist and figure out why it is that the Supreme Court decided what it decided today. Do you ever have your mom's voice in the back of your mind? Like, what would mom think of this? <laughs> I mean, I think that that would be a little she bit was scary, the -lawyer. honestly. She was the non-lawyer. <laughs> it would be a little bit scary. You could never really meet her standards. So, uh, <laughs> so she was tough. So I have a more generous voice. <laughs> you know? Well, you're, you're, I'll, I'll jump ahead to a point I wanted to talk about a little bit later was Justice Scalia. He had a, something similar with his father. My understanding is his father would mark up his D.C. Circuit opinions. Oh, my gosh. Send them back. So if my mother, If it. my he mother had been it. alive by the time I started judging, she would have done the same thing. Yeah. Well, well while we're on the topic of Justice Scalia. Um, Some, you know, it's funny when you said that because one of the things that I've sometimes said about Justice Scalia is, you know, just sometimes Justice Scalia and I, I'll give you a little bit of a shock. Sometimes we were on different sides of an issue. I'm trying to think. And I used to, I used to have a little um, Nino Scalia voice right over here. Um, so effective at that. He did the same thing to me. Okay, it's, except it's, it, it, you were probably on different sides less often. But I used to think, like, what would he say about this argument? And that's an extremely helpful thing to, uh, to have. It's like, okay, if I know what Justice Scalia is going, how Justice Scalia is going to try to pick apart this argument, then you figure out how to make it stronger so that it will be less vulnerable to the great Justice Scalia dismantling. Now, whether you could really ever do that, you know, he, he always had things to say, notwithstanding my efforts. <laughs> but, um, but sometimes I did. I, I, thought, of, I thought of him a, a lot. Like, you know, what, what's he going to say about this? What, what's he going to admit is good? <laughs> and what's he go and what's he going to think is like really oh he worse. was the best he never gave out compliments but when he did you knew they were real and i'm sure he a did absolutely to you yeah but yeah well I, I know firsthand he had tremendous respect for you he was thrilled when you went on the court you, you should talk about what you, your relationship with justice scalia uh, why are we talking about justice scalia is because uh, okay so i clerked, Sutton is clerked he, for justice yeah, so, scalia. right so that exactly thank you um but as I know firsthand from that experience and staying in touch with him, he was thrilled when you went on the court. He had tremendous respect for you and a lot of affection for you. And You so say that as though it's like surprising. Well, <laughs> you're, 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 nice you're, the person, Jeff. you're the one that introduced <laughs> the point that you didn't always agree. So the, the thing that I think some people in the audience might assume, lawyers or not, is that people that disagree about the meaning of the Constitution might have a hard time ha having a close friendship. And maybe you could explain how that worked, because I think yeah. it, it did work. You did it, disagree. It totally did work. I, I mean, I, you know, I had an enormous amount of respect for him um, and the kind of judge he was, uh, first of all. Um, but I also just liked him enormously. And we were good friends. I mean, I found him an extremely generous, funny, uh, warm human being. Uh, which is not necessarily something that you get when you read his opinions, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I, I, you know that kind of personal warmth. Um, but 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 he was he was you know a wonderful colleague. He was um, he had a great sense of humor, and um, and he was a great friend. I mean, he was a great friend to a lot of people, and he cared about his friendships a lot. Yeah. Well, you clerked for just. He used to say, by the way, about this business about disagreeing. I mean, one of the things that I heard him say many, many times was he said, you know, y you can't take it personally. If you take it personally, you're in the wrong job, meaning you can't take what, uh, you know, if I'm writing the majority and he's writing the dissent or vice versa, um, uh, especially if I was writing the majority and he was writing the dissent and he comes at you really hard. And, um, but, you know, he would say, look, plenty of people came at him really hard and you just can't take it personally. That's, that's not the nature of the business. And, and so, you know, that was one of the things that, that I actually uh, learned from him is it, it wasn't personal. It was, you know, he, he, uh, he believed very strongly in um, some ideas and I believed very strongly in other ideas. And so there was nothing personal about it when we went head to head um, and you shouldn't take it that way. Well, I, he, I heard him say it many times. I tried so hard tried so hard to internalize it, it's never worked. 
I, I, can't tell, I can't think of a time I got a dissent from one of my majorities or I'm writing the majority, someone else is dissenting, where the first time I read it, I said, well, this is not about me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, this is just at a level like this. And, um, no, it's, how not fun, about, it's not about how, the ideas. How it's fun, not about yeah, the let's just discuss the ideas. No, yeah. I, I find it a lot easier to discuss your ideas versus Justice Scalia ideas, uh -huh. because then I'm not in the middle of it. <laughs> I find it very hard. I think it takes a lot. Um, maybe that says something about me. But um, he well, once, you know, there was uh, there was uh, there was one opinion. I don't. Some people would know what this is, um, where he um, really went after not only the opinion writer, which was not me, but the opinion joiners. And he said, like, if I had ever joined an opinion like that, I would put a paper bag over my head, <laughs> or, or something like that. And you read that, and I, 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 I take your point. It did seem, <laughs> it did seem a little bit personal. <laughs> but um, well, well, I, I never, I, I learned early on that I was not going to try to be like Justice Scalia, not only because I didn't remotely. Well, I have to say that I do. I mean, uh, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, nobody quite has the wit of uh, Justice Scalia, or the, uh, that, you know, I, I have a sharp pen too, or I can. And so it would be the last thing I would do was to say, oh, that's really terrible. Because, you know, I've been known to um, be pretty, I, I've been known to be a little bit acerbic myself. Well, I, I, was, I would put it slightly differently, and I'll not put it in those terms, but I would say that uh, Justice Scalia had courage. So take Morrison versus Olson. It took courage to be a lone dissenter. Chief Justice Rehnquist. The year I clerked majority. was the year he wrote that dissent. You, then you would know. Extraordinary, because it was. It was an eight. It was. This was the constitutionality of the independent counsel case, and um, everybody else thought. Well, it was just a. a it was a very different time, diff, um, different view of the law, maybe different experiences that the country had had, and uh, everybody thought. Well, of course, the independent counsel statute is constitutional. And uh, eight to one, and he wrote this lone dissent, and uh, like everybody, everybody else thought it was crazy, and it turns out to be one of the great dissenting opinions of all time, and um, and to have a lot of, you know, not just in terms of the way it's written, but it had a lot of prescience about some of the difficulties of having an independent counsel and what you should be concerned about, which is not necessarily to say that he was right, but it is to say that you know he wrote an extremely effective. Uh, good and in many respects prescient dissent and and it just shows you sort of like how time can give you a different perspective because at the time really like everybody was walking around the court going what is he doing <laughs> why is he doing it so maybe that's uh, in his writing sometimes he was too courageous that might be the way I would put it he was too courageous with his pen periodically that's my loyal Scalia clerk speaking of loyalty to s Supreme Court justices you clerk for Justice Marshall, which just strikes me as this incredible gift. Um, that was at a different time. What was it like? I mean, it was an incredible gift. I mean, in like every respect. Um, so I clerked for Justice Marshall. He was nearing the end of his uh, career. And um, you know, maybe he was looking back a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, we were really treated not just to the typical Supreme Court clerkship. Um, uh, which is, you know, a great experience, as you and many other people know. Um, but like to a daily history lesson. I mean, he was, you know, my view, the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. He is an iconic American figure, you know, one of the great people in American history. And we would go into his office every day, and we would do the sort of standard Supreme Court business. We would talk about the cases and about opinions and things like that. But then at some point, uh, that would be done, and he would segue into like <laughs> storytelling, honestly. And he was the greatest storyteller that I have. It's not only that he had great stories to tell, but he was, in fact, the greatest storyteller I've ever known. He was a sort of rock hunter. He was funny. He did um, impressions of people. He had he had voices that and where they were very good. And uh, you know he could sometimes he turned it on some of his colleagues maybe I won't <laughs> but but um, he you know he he had he had facial expressions he had this marvelously mobile face and uh, so it was it was a little bit like a show but it was uh, um, but it's also a history lesson I mean there are these these people and 
you know, I, we were all in our late 20s or something, and uh, we were being treated to somebody giving us a sort of oral history of some of the most important events of our time. Um, you know, he was, when I say he was like the greatest lawyer of the 20th century, I mean, you know, number one, I, I would think that he did the most justice, right? Um, and to be in the presence of somebody for a year who had done so much to change the face of America and um, to make it a more just society was really quite extraordinary in itself. Um, he was also just um, a fantastic lawyer. He was, um, and, he, and, he, and he showed that even as he was a judge. I mean, he was one of the very few Supreme Court justices who really their principal contributions came before they were a justice, right? I mean, he was a very fine justice, but, but he was a great, great, great uh, lawyer in terms of just you know the, um, what he contributed to the country. And also just his skills were very much sort of lawyerly skills. So he was, um, like nobody has a lawyerly career like this, uh, where you know, on the one hand he was a, a magnificent appellate lawyer. He argued about, I don't know, 25 cases for the Supreme Court and won all but three of them. He was also a fantastic trial lawyer. He roamed around the American South, you know, when it was not easy as a uh, black man to um, travel around the American South, appearing in these small town courtrooms where, um, you know, he and his colleagues were the only um, black faces and that where they were uh, not treated uh, very often with uh, the appropriate respect and uh, where sometimes they faced real physical dangers, um, and he had stories about that. Um, but he was a he was a great sort of like little old town trial lawyer, as well as you know sometimes coming up to the podium of the of the Supreme Court. So he had kind of like all the skills in one, and it, it was it was really something to learn from him. Well, listening to you, when I think of his opinions, they do emphasize the facts. That makes sense. Yeah, given he, he was a, he, you know, he, 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 he cared about the facts. He cared about how law worked on the ground. He always thought about how law affected uh, people where they lived. You know, he didn't think of the law as some sort of like abstract, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's, he, he didn't think about law as sort of some, a set of abstract ideas. He really thought about law in the way it met everyday lives and affected everyday lives. At the same time, he was like a real rules person. Um, so he was- um, Rules, not standards, huh? Yeah, he, he, he was a rules guy. He, he, uh, there was this one case where all the clerks um, were sort of ganging up on him <laughs> because like all the clerks were like, well, we have to, you know, fairness suggests we do this, you know, standards, equity. And he was like, no, he was, he, he was the rules guy. It was a case about whether you could, um, it, was, it, was, it was a case about whether you could bring an appeal after 30 days or something. It was, it was a, a Title VII plaintiff who uh, his lawyer had really messed up and he uh, hadn't, you know, through no fault of his own, you know, he had filed an appeal on the 32nd day rather than on the 30th day. And, um, uh, you didn't make the argument that those days don't matter. Did you make that argument? Well, I mean, we, we said this is like not a strict jurisdictional rules. It has some kind of equitable exceptions. But he was having none of it. And, uh, and I remember that he said like all you can expect as a, uh, you know, as a person who is maybe, um, you know, not the person that society uh, treats well, you know, maybe the, um, the, the minority person, the person who is not uh, uh, privileged and who decision makers don't pay much respect to, it's like all you can expect is that they play by the rules. And if they play by the rules, um, like that's what you're aiming for, to get them to play by the rules. Right, and he could have thought in Reconstruction, we didn't play by the rules. It really hurt that you could really see that. Well, he would have, it's so sad that he couldn't see you become Solicitor General as yeah. he was. Obviously he was, he, he was, I had a big picture of him in my office when I was Solicitor General, of him as Solicitor General. And he thought that that was the greatest job he ever had. Because, I, I mean, and for him, it was really quite extraordinary to be able to go up to the podium of the Supreme Court and, and basically, you know, the, it's like I'm Thurgood Marshall and I'm representing the United States. I, I mean, I think for him, it was like how far this country had come. Well, 
Brown versus Board of Education would have been pretty nice, but still, I, I grant there was an other bigger docket. So your time as Solicitor General, um, any favorite arguments? Are there any ways in which that job has affected your approach to your current job? Yeah, so I was only Solicitor General for a year. And you know, if, I could, if you could really do your life, I would have loved to have been Solicitor General for longer. It's a fantastic job. Um, uh, you get to make all the decisions about appeals um, for the United States. And you know, um, so in addition to just the Supreme Court work, you're really in charge of the whole appellate docket for the United States. Um, and then in terms of the Supreme Court, you know, every month you go and if you're SG, you argue the most important case. And uh, you know, it's really fun arguing before the Supreme Court. It's very hard because there are nine people and they're all confident and they all have a lot to say and they're all trying to speak to each other at the same time that they're asking you questions and sometimes you're just getting in the way up there. <laughs> they're having a very nice conversation and what are you doing <laughs> trying to get a word in edgewise? Um, uh, but you know, super interesting cases and um, so, so you know, I was, I was, you, you can't say to the president, I'm sorry, could you just hold off and wait a few more years? But, but I would have loved to have done it for longer. Uh, uh, my, my, my first case at the court was the re-argument of Citizens United. So Citizens United had been this campaign finance case which had started off as a pretty small campaign finance case. And it had not gone well for the government. This was um, in the spring, just as I came on to the court, um, and one of my uh, associates had done the argument. It had not gone very well, and then on the last day of the year, the court issued um, a re-argument notice. And it said, in particular, that the court wanted to, to think about whether to overrule two seminal cases about um, the intersection between campaign finance and the First Amendment. And you could know from the order um, that basically they were ready to overturn these cases, but they didn't think that it was appropriate to do so without at least hearing argument on the question. Um, so that was my first argument. Had you had arguments in the lower courts? Yeah, so uh, you know, I had had um, arguments in district courts. I had never had an appellate argument, you know, because I had left practice pretty young and um, then been an academic and then been a, go a government um, uh, lawyer and a government policy maker. So it was my first appellate argument ever. Wow. And, um, and you, wow. were, you know, I was kind of aware that it was a big <laughs> argument and every, everybody was going to be watching me and that was a little bit petrifying. Um, now, on the other hand, I, I mean, I can't really tell you that I thought, uh, that the, the fate of campaign finance rested on my shoulders because it was just so clear what the court was going to do that I, I, I felt as Didn't though- Didn't you talk to yourself? I always talk myself into thinking I could win. Yeah, I don't think in this case where they, <laughs> where they issue a, uh, you know, we, we are, dis we're, you know, uh, be you, know, you should it argue about whether these two cases should be overruled. After uh, I, this is a motion for reconsideration. I mean no, I mean that, you know, that, you know that, that's what their order said. You know, yeah. it's like here's the re we're going to hear this case again the next year, uh, and particularly address in your briefing whether these two big cases should be overruled. So it's uh, I, I think kind of everybody thought that they would just the answer was going to be yes, they should be overruled. So so I, I thought that the pressure was off a little bit on that, and not to say that it wasn't still a little bit. Um, scary, but um, one of the great things about the SG's office is you work with magnificent people. It's a fantastic collection of lawyers. And um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, uh, they taught me a lot about, uh, you know, uh, we did a, lo a, a number of moots, formal and informal. And I get up there and um, I remember, you know, I had a few sentences prepared to just, uh, say first thing before the question started. I figured people would let me get out a few sentences. I, I got out one sentence, and I think it was like an incredibly anodyne sentence. And uh, Justice Scalia, speaking of Justice Scalia, leaned over the bench in this kind of you know way he had and said, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, four times. Now, I have to say that when I first, when I once told this story and in front I, of I, him? I, I, yeah, I, I did tell him, but, um, 
But the way I had remembered it in my head, he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> And it turned out that I had told it wrong, and somebody corrected me, and it was really, wait, 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 wait. But, you know, he had some objection to my first sentence, right, <laughs> which was something about the history of campaign finance. But I thought he, uh, I actually thought he did me a great favor, because he just got me into the argument right away. Then it wasn't like I was making a speech. It wasn't like, okay, what's the next sentence I'm supposed to say, or the next sentence? I was just like having a conversation or having an argument, as the case may be. So um, I, I, so it, it I found out to be pretty fun. I found he to be a good foil, because you knew where he was coming from. If, totally. If he could kind of capture the point and say, we understand what you're saying. Right. Could be really and he effective. was also good about, and this is, it, he said, like, does it change the way I'm a judge? And I would say this, I, he was good this way. Uh, like, he would come at you very hard and tell you exactly what he thought was wrong with your argument. Um, but then he would give you an opportunity to come back, and he would listen to you. And, you know, it's not like you were going to always, or, or most of the time, or uh -huh. even more than occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> convince him of anything. But he would give you an opportunity to say your piece, just as he had said his piece. And that's something that I do try to remember when I'm up there. You know, it can, because uh, we all have a lot to say, and I want, uh, you know, sometimes my questions are real questions, but sometimes, m m I think for most of us, that we're less asking questions than making points that we also want our colleagues to listen to, because it's the first time we ever really talk about a case together, right? And we're going to go into conference in a day or in two days or something. And, p and partly the whole way argument is structured is, is to, you know, have an opportunity to let your colleagues know what you're thinking before you go around the table in conference. Um, but, but that said, like, I always try to think it's, you know, from a lawyer's point of view, they've prepared so hard for this. And even if they're not going to convince you, you have an obligation, I think, to let them get their points out. So sometimes, you know, I'll say something and ask a question. It won't really be a question. It will be more like a point. And, uh, but, and then they'll say something, and, and, and I feel as though sometimes, I could tell you six reasons why you're wrong, but I, tr I try to kind of re uh, suppress that. Maybe one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Would you ever walk onto the bench and say, you know, this morning I kind of wish I were there? The advocate, yeah. It's a lot harder than what I do, I think. I think that it's a, a super hard thing yeah. to argue in the Supreme Court. Just, you know, it's, it, nine people, it's hard to argue in front of nine people who all have their particular takes on something and who are all, and at, at that time, um, our, our arguments have kind of expanded in the amount of yeah. time that they yeah, take. Yeah, what's going on there? Yeah, like we can talk <laughs> about that. But at that time, the whole argument was compressed into an hour. So, so it was yeah. usually half an hour, both sides. Sometimes it was 20, 10, 30. So like everybody was jumping in all the time. And you could, really, one of the, uh, the great talents of the people who argued at that time, I think it's less important now, honestly, is being able to make your point in the first sentence or two. You know, that there was, if, if you were the kind of person who did a bit of throat clearing before you got to the point, mm -hmm. um, well, you weren't going to get to the point. <laughs> so that was a problem, yeah. So um, we talked a little bit about not- You were in SJ. I, I was. Thank you for mentioning yeah, that. Yeah, so you no, were I, Ohio's I, SG. I, I tell state SGs, it, I disagree with Justice Marshall. I think the best job is to be a state SG. Uh huh. I do. I mean, it's one state. I mean, the whole 330 million people, you can't make them all happy. I could make the people of Ohio happy. So <laughs> I. How, how, and, long, and, and how long were you? Uh, three and a half years. Plus, and do you ever feel like you want to go over there and get behind the podium? Only if I had two weeks ahead of time. But yes, I miss, Justice Ginsburg once said, Jeff, how do you like being a judge? And I said, well, I, I really, it's a privilege, I really enjoy it, but I do miss being an advocate. And she said, without missing a beat, oh, Jeff, you're still an advocate. I thought, That's, <laughs> that is not the description of a judge. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I yeah, was what tempted are you to say, to be it, well, it, I, it was tempted to say it takes one to know one, but uh, I, <laughs> but I, I actually. Yeah, did she say it as a kind of, you're, you're in, you're, like she was making a comment about you? 
or was she making a comment about judges in general? I think she was. I think she was making a really good point, which I took to be a compliment. And I think the point was, um, how could you be a judge for a while and not have a perspective? Yeah. And of course, that's what she meant. You're advocating that perspective when precedent doesn't control and when there's something gray. And I, th that makes perfect sense to me. You're not going to be a blank slate every case. And so, I. I I did not take it as a compliment initially, but I'm, I'm so good at rationalizing. I, <laughs> I turned it around into thinking, well, wow, how thoughtful. Um, so we, we talked about um, Justice Scalia and, and disagreement and you know, the objective to not take it personally. Hard to do, but it's really good advice. Is there anything else you could recommend to lower court judges? So you know, the, you know, the other 970 of us out there that you know, we, and, in, and we're really focusing on the Court of Appeals judges for now anyway, because we're going to be the ones having the disagreement, right? So we're going to sit in groups of three. So the 200 of us, um, you know, we still have disagreements. Uh, we still have courts that, you know, we, when we have in-banks, there seems to be some block voting, and, you know, we're, something about that doesn't seem right. Um, you that, know, that never happens at the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. Well, w anyway. Um, <laughs> It, it's, it's a challenging time to be a judge, I yeah. would say. Uh -huh. and, I, I mean, is there anything you would, you know, someone, you know, I don't know if you have, have any former clerks, it's, you're so young, it's probably a, a few years away, but I don't know if you have any former clerks becoming Court of Appeals judges, but what would you say? I just had my first. Bingo. What would, yeah. you, what would you say to him or her about how to be yourself? Don't be afraid to advocate for what you think is right, but be a good colleague. Because, I mean, you can't be a one-person show on a three-person court or a 16-member court, how, how would you, what, what would the advice be? Well, I, I don't, I, I mean, I guess I don't think of them as in tension with each other. That I, I just think you can be a, a good and strong judge and also be a good colleague, and that's mm -hmm. in fact part of being a good and strong judge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I think people make different decisions and have different perspectives mm -hmm. on, um, uh, on, on, on my court, anyway, about um, how frequently you write separately. I'm, I'm a little bit of an institutionalist, um, so I, I don't write separately all that often. I mean, I write dissents when, um, when I need to write a dissent, and I hope that I write strong and powerful dissents, and that I view that as an important part of what I do, and these days I view it as uh, a really oh. important part of what I do. Um, <laughs> But I don't, uh, you know, I try not to be. Uh, you, you know, if you look at people's, how many separate writings uh, they have, you know, usually I'm, I'm pretty low down. And uh, because I, 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 I guess I think that to the extent the court can, mm -hmm. um, the court shouldn't be fractured. I think that that really confuses matters for lower courts uh, who are trying to figure out what we're saying to them. Um, I think it's like basically not about individual judges. I think it is about the court as a whole and the law. So I try not to be the kind of, um, you know, I have this to say about this general matter. Now, other people disagree with that. You know, there, there we have a whole very wide spectrum on the court about people mm -hmm. who sort of say, I, 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 w I want to express my individual point of view even when I join a majority opinion or something like that. So there are different ways of being a judge in, in that sense. I mean, I, I guess for me, it's important, uh, you know, th I think that the court functions best when it's mm -hmm. functioning as something of an institution rather than nine completely separate players. Well, one thing consist that's consistent with your being an institutionalist is your view of stare decisis, which you call a doctrine of humility. What, what, do you, what did you mean when you said that? Yeah, I mean, it's only one of the things that w reasons why we have a, 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 a stare decisis, wh why it, those principles play or should play such an important role in judging. But I guess um, that, that particular point is just, just that. It's that, you know, it's easy to kind of get on the court and think. Uh, what were they uh, thinking? <laughs> y you, know, y you know, what were they thinking? And that's just got to be wrong. And my, my perspective is better. And um, so I'm going to do things my way. And... Um, one of the things that stare decisis does is to tell judges, you know, don't be so fast in saying that, that there's a kind of wisdom of the ages 
and if a lot of different judges have seen something differently, you should uh, you know, ask yourself and then ask yourself again, are you so sure that you have it right? Maybe all those people who thought something different, maybe they were right, and you should you know, scrutinize it pretty carefully. Now, it's not to say it's a rigid automatic rule. I mean, there are reasons to overturn precedent. I think most of them have to do with really changed circumstances. Um, life moves on, our society moves on. Sometimes uh, it, you know, it comes to a pass where y you just gotta say that um, uh, a, a rule has, has to be changed. Um, but, but you should approach that with a fair bit of uh, am I sure kind of attitude and with a sort of you know, sense of humility. I mean, um, you know, look, you know, stability is also important for the law. People rely on law. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are reasons to keep law as it is, even if it's not perfect or even if it's not right, um, because you'll be ex upsetting people's expectations and their reliance interests. Um, so that's another uh, reason why uh, stare decisis is important. Um, uh, yet another reason is because when the court sort of goes back and forth, depending on individual judges who come on and then they say, well, you know, they were wrong and we'll do it differently. And then another judge comes along and they say, well, they were wrong and we'll do it differently. And the law flip flops and it doesn't really look like law anymore. It kind of looks like a form of politics. And I think that that's especially important for this Supreme Court at this time. Uh, that law should not look like a form of politics where just because the composition of the court changes, a whole batch of legal rules change with it. And indeed our legal, you know, really our legal system changes. And um, uh, you know, what was once a right is no longer a right because the court is different. I mean, I think that that's very damaging to the court, very damaging to society, but, um, but Going back to where we started, it is, you know, a, a doctrine of humility in the sense of, uh, y you know, you put a robe on, it doesn't mean that you're going to make the right decisions. And uh, you should always say to yourself, you know, are there people, if people have seen it differently for a long time, am I so sure I'm right? Yeah. So you occupy uh, the seat that uh, Justice Brandeis occupied. Um, he's one of my favorite justices, one of the most well-known Supreme Court justices. And, you know, in the early 30s, really before FDR, you know, kind of changes, nationalizes so many things, you know, he has his famous laboratories of experimentation. Brandeis was a progressive. He thought the states had a really si significant role to play in dealing with new economic and policy and social challenges, um, but it is pre-FDR. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in a way, uh, he's probably responding a little bit to Lochner. Um, do you think there's still a role for the states to play, or do you think it's, it's just a, that was then and this is now, and um, things are really are quite a bit different post-FDR? Well, I feel like I shouldn't be answering that question because you've written whole books about this. Well, no, so, well, so I, want you I to think it showed remarkable question. patience for me to take this long into the interview to talk, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the one thing I know something about. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so no, no, I'm trying to pin you down. Yeah, no, the no, states no, have a role you, to play you and first. you're not going you to. You go first. You, the I, answer for you is yes. The answer is yes. And um, we have just as many tricky problems as uh, the country faced yeah. when Brandeis was around. And um, it's pretty dangerous to nationalize things too quickly, whether through legislation or court decisions. You know, it's, I, I think his idea of, he was, he, I will, it's, it is important to point out, he was referring to legislatures and not state courts. Right. But I would take the view, I mean, I would be curious. This is, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, we had an argument about this this morning. Yeah. No, no, I. <laughs> The, uh, I'm, the, a, I'm a little bit fearful of the, going the, further. The, the question presented <laughs> in, at all, every turn in American history is what should be national and what should be local. Yeah. And that's, that's, but I guess there's, a there's an option for localism from time to time. From time to time. Then yeah. the question is what times? And, and how about for progressives? Would you say for progressives? From time to time. And then the question is what times? Uh-huh. So yeah, you're, you're so evasive. Uh, <laughs> The one thing I was I'm, most I'm excited, like the this, one thing. I'm this morning echo in my head. Oh. I'm feeling like maybe we should go on to a different question. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. Okay, well then what would, you, okay, this is very different. 
What would you be doing if you were, had never been a law professor, um, never a judge, never an advocate? So you got to take your parents' professions off the table. Uh huh. What would you be doing today? Oh gosh, um, I went through a lot of things. In, in my, uh, you, you know, there was a moment in time where I thought I was going to be a doctor, but then I just couldn't like stand the idea of taking all those pre-med courses. Like, uh, you know, did you take any of? Oh uh, yeah, a little bit, but. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know, wasn't I, like, at one point I was going to be the world's greatest tennis player. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't, that's because I, did, I wasn't, you know, <laughs> by a long shot. <laughs> um, uh, I think when I was in college, I thought pretty seriously of um, going and getting a PhD and becoming a historian. And then I did my thesis, and I spent a lot of time in an archives and decided you know, maybe that was a little bit too cloistered for me and that I wanted something where I would feel a lot of um, intellectual stimulation, but also feel as though I was part of the world. Um, uh, so it worked out. I, I have to say, I can brag, I think I'm the only person in the audience that has read your master's thesis. And it's so good. It's it's about. Why did you it's, do that? It's a it's a <laughs> it's about uh, the audience knows the map exclusionary rule and what's so fun about geez, I, I really really admired it because this is pre-law. You hadn't gone to law yeah, school Yeah, I hadn't yet. gone to law school. And I've always suspected you supported the exclusionary rule. Of course, Justice Brandeis hinted at the idea of many years before. But the essence of the thesis was to critique the reasoning. Yeah, that they didn't really the, the uh, ever reasoning of the court. find a good reason for it. Yeah, yeah, which is very consistent with the judge you became. Uh -huh. How was that? Someone who, it's like Justice Scalia, someone who cares about reasoning. Yeah. That it's not enough just to have an outcome you like. And uh, so I, Anyway, I think it's terrific, and uh, I, 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 what are you, like the one in the three people as, uh, <laughs> in the world who has read that? We, we live in a world, first of all, we can get these How can technologically, you, get you don't have to travel to Britain, <laughs> you get it out, take it out of the library, we have two copies, I think a lot of people have read it, I've seen it cited, it's, <laughs> it's um, it, it is really, it is really good. Yeah, well, you, you have a chance, I, I don't think you've written about that. I don't think I don't think you've had a, you've written yet about the exclusionary rule. I have I not. You've got to do that. I, I I'm there's one person <laughs> but I, here. I have no idea what I said about it 30 oh, years oh, ago. Oh, oh, you need to go read it. Must it. be 40 years ago. Have now. one of your clerks. They're here. Uh -huh. Go look at it. <laughs> it's really good. Well, so we have, uh, as you know, this is a Supreme Court. What did you want to do if not be a lawyer? Oh, I mean, law was three. I wanted to be well. First of all, of course, a professional athlete, and look at me. That was <laughs> school teacher. I did that for a little uh -huh. while, and then. Uh, I wanted to solve the Middle East crisis. I was born in the Middle East and- Where were you born? Saudi Arabia. Oh God. So I always thought I would- uh, Why were you born in Saudi Arabia? My father was born in Jerusalem and um, we're, we're losing track of the point of this interview, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, he was born in Jerusalem to missionary parents, so he grew up in the Middle East as well. Oh. So I always thought I would go there and fix the Palestine Israeli crisis. That, which it that would like have been harder be than what you do now. I know. It's, yeah. it's, sadly, it's yeah. sadly still there. So we have a bunch of Supreme Court fellows and younger lawyers. And you know, I, I, I don't know if this was true for you. I was really paralyzed early on with choices about where to go. And was there any advice about those first couple choices? Because you did private practice a little bit, then you were teaching, obviously right. after clerking. Any advice to young lawyers about how to think through these next steps? I think it so depends on individual personalities. You know, I did do a lot of different things. I went uh, after clerking, private practice, uh, into teaching, back into government work. And, uh, you know, for me, that was really important, actually, that I loved that variety, uh -huh. that I loved feeling as though I had done a lot of different things and that uh, my skill sets were growing and that every time I felt as though the learning curve had flattened out. There was an opportunity to do something completely new and different where I could, uh, where the learning curve you know, shot up again. So for me, that was really important, but uh, you, you might ask like, am I, how does that work in my current job? And um, uh, it doesn't, so, I, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it's, good that I got my, it's good that I got my current <laughs> job later on in my life. Um, but, uh, but you know, other people just, you know, find one thing that fills them with a lot of meaning and joy and purpose, and uh, they do that for their entire legal career. So I guess it, it just sort of depends on who you are. I mean, one of the things that I used to 
tell students when I was a law dean, I always used to think that law students planned too much. That they would say, well, first I have to do this. I don't really want to do this, but I have to do this because that's the way to get the next thing, which maybe I do want to do, and then that should, and you know, they had their whole lives planned out. And I guess um, for me, that's, that's not the way life worked. You know, that um, so much of what I did at any given moment was not because it was on a grand plan, but um, that, you know, sort of serendipity happened. And um, all of a sudden I had an opportunity to do something that I hadn't really ever considered. And then I thought, well, that would be fun. I would learn something and I would have a good time doing that. Um, so I always tell people like plan a little bit less and keep your eye out more for just unexpected opportunities. You, me you mentioned the, ten the stage when you were both dean of Harvard Law School, teacher at Chicago and Harvard. Did that experience affect your approach to judging at all? I think the thing that, uh, that most affects my judging from being an academic is actually not the academic work I did, but uh, was, is, is the teaching. And um, when I write an opinion, what I think about is, is, um, is, is how I would teach a class. Because I think you're, you're doing much the same thing. You know, you're trying to take these difficult concepts and uh, sometimes, you know, very arcane subject matter. And you asked me before about who my audience is. And I guess my audience is smart people, interested people, the people who don't know a lot about a given area. And that's the way I used to think about law students, you know, smart and interested. But when I walked into a class, they didn't know a lot about it. And so when you thought about teaching, when I did, I thought about, you know, how am I going to explain these complicated concepts in a way that will, that people will get, and also in a way that will stick with people. Like I think mm -hmm. different ways of speaking and writing can be sort of sticky or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I used to think about in teaching, and that's the exact same thing I think about when I sit down to write an opinion. It's like, this is complicated. This is a, you know, what kind of story am I going to tell? So what kind of story was I going to tell in a classroom? And what kind of story am I going to tell on the page mm -hmm. to make people understand what the problem is and what we're doing? Yeah, I, did, I, had, I had no experience teaching law before being a judge, but I will say teaching law after being a judge, if I think of the areas where I'm not inclined towards stare decisis, or I'm in, you know, obviously as a lower court judge, we would follow it, but I would be quite liberated about critiquing a doctrine. It would be having taught the doctrine and having seen students try to figure struggle out. Struggle with it. Right, right. Yeah. Or, or seen lower court judges struggle with it. I mean, that, that's probably the one area where I'd like, I'd like to think I'm always trying to be humble, but boy, if you see something that no one else can figure out, I do feel like that's a good time for us to at least identify it. Um, and so I think teaching can be super helpful there. How about, so I think you're close to your 14th year. This is hard to believe. I think this is my 14th year. I mean, close it? to the end of yeah, the 14th yeah. year uh -huh. as, as a justice. Is there a way in which there's been live and learn changes? I mean, if you were comparing those first couple of years of how you worked with your clerks, how you interacted with others, what you, when you wrote separately to today. You know, it's funny. I mean, I guess some things have gotten easier just because they do get easier. Things that took a long time my first year don't take so long now. Um, but I, I actually think that I'm, I'm pretty much the same person doing the same job. I, I, the court has changed, of course, and my role in it has changed some. But in terms of like, the way I think about judging and the way I do judging on a day-to-day -day basis, I think I'm, I'm uh, more stable than not. And writing's the same? Even the writing separately point, you were saying that you, uh, you started as an institutionalist? That's impressive. Yeah, I, I think I did. I, I, Didn't Justice what, Stevens talk to you? I mean, Justice Stevens was one of the people who wrote separately the most. You took his chambers. Weren't there like, write whenever you can <laughs> all, all over the... <laughs> and th th that didn't affect you? I guess I don't feel that need to, like, I, I, have, I have a thought here, so I just want to <laughs> tell the world about it, you know? I mean, I, I, uh -huh. I tell the world about my thoughts when I have a job to do, which is like I, I have a a majority to write because somebody has assigned a majority to me. 
or when I have a, a dissenter, right, because I think the majority has gone very wrong. I think that there are a lot of times when I'll read somebody else's majority opinion and say, you know, I would have done something a little bit differently. I would have uh, stressed this rather than that. I, you know, you know, there's an additional point that I would have put in. I, I guess I try not to do that. I think, um, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, it's not about me. It's, uh, yeah, it's that's, a, uh, that's always a good uh, thing. Uh, you know, it sounds a little bit like I'm patting myself on the back, but, um, you know, I'm part of like a group project yeah, and yeah. the project works best when we act as an institution, which, you know, sometimes we're incapable of doing. <laughs> but, you know, it's good. Because it's we hard. It's, it's difficult. It's, you guys get asked to do a lot. Anything you would recommend to lower court judges about things we could do a little better than we're currently doing? I feel like you should tell us stuff. And, and here's the reason, and I don't say this to flatter anybody, but I think that you guys have much harder jobs than we do. I mean, I think w we, uh, number one, have incredible lawyers at the Supreme Court Bar. I mean, almost all the lawyers who come up to us are you know, just fantastic. But doesn't that make it harder? I sometimes no, see these I cases think that, that look so they, easy, they and then you, these, you get seven these smart great people. Briefs and these great arguments, and you have all the raw materials. And the other thing that we have that you guys don't have, like we have, all we have to decide is basically a single question. You know, by the time the case we comes actually, up to us. I have to, to clarify, you don't have to do anything because you get to decide what you decide. That's true, that's true too. <laughs> uh, so that is not right. lost on we'll, us. We'll, 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 we'll put that on the list too. Um, and then when we do, we've sort of uh, distilled a case to a legal question. Whereas you guys, you get these cases and they're messy and there are all kinds of questions and they're colliding with each other and different people want you to answer different things. And you have to kind of make sense of uh, messy stuff mm -hmm. in a way that I think we much, much less frequently do. Yeah. Well, um, I th and I th then we write these fractured opinions and we don't even tell you how to, you know. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm against fracture. I, I'm, I'm t you have everybody on that. I, I mean, maybe there should be a nine, this goes back maybe you know, not, not that we want eight justices, God forbid, but I did notice a court that did have a lot more unanimity when you had only eight justices. I don't know if you remember, this is post-Justice Scalia's death. Yeah, right? I mean, it was a very interesting time for the court. Um, uh, and I, I've talked about this before. I, th I thought that um, there was so there's actually something to be said about a, a court with an even number of justices rather than an odd number Forces. of justices because it forces compromise where you don't think compromise is possible. And sometimes it led to some, a little bit of you know, silly decision making. It's like, oh my gosh, well we have to do something. So, um, so we would find some way to agree on something that was like what n nobody cared about and nobody was, uh, you know, that was not the question, the real question and it was not an important question. So there were times when it felt a little bit silly but there were more times, I thought, many more times, when it actually felt as though um, it forced us to have a conversation that was useful and valuable and that did produce greater consensus. And what it usually meant was that, you know, um, even when people disagree profoundly on big stuff, they can usually find smaller stuff. So if you sort of ratchet down the importance of a case and of a question, you can usually find something to agree about. And there's real value in that, you know, just making things a little bit smaller so that you can agree on more and actually send a signal um, about, uh, uh, about the possibility of agreement in law. So. Well, it was really not a, a Supreme Court if it's 4 4, right? It means the lower courts affirm. So they're not the Supreme Court. Right. So we court. tried you hard. Have to, you have to I mean, we tried hard not to do 4 4, affirmed by an equally divided court. Yeah. And as I say, I, I actually thought it led to um, some really great conversations among the justices. You know, because when you go around the table and you come out 5 4, I mean, all the incentives are that people stop talking at that point, right? They've yeah. reached a decision, and, uh, y you know, what's the use of banging it around uh, more? when you come out for for it, well then then there then there is a benefit to you know keeping on talking and when you kept on talking it wasn't just that one vote would change you would just often find a way 
to reformulate the question and to, uh, or just, uh, you know, even if not that, it's just um, a way to think about something from a, a different angle so that many more people could agree. Yeah. So we, um, we just lost Justice O'Connor, and I'm trying to think, I, did you know her that, had you gotten a chance? Yeah, I didn't know her very well. I mean, she was off the court by the time I became Solicitor General. Mm -hmm. I knew her a little bit when I was um, a, a law school dean. She came to, to Harvard a few times then. Um, uh, you know, she gave me some nice advice when I became Solicitor General and when I became a justice. So I, I didn't know her very well, but I had enormous amount of respect for her and um, what she did as a justice. Do you th are there any ways, any legacies at the current court that are Justice O'Connor legacies? Yeah, well it's hard because, um, uh, I, I mean I think, you know, um, some of Justice O'Connor's um, great moments have been abandoned by this mm -hmm. court. Mm -hmm. And it's um, a little bit maybe the fate of a swing justice yeah. who was extremely important in her own time because, you know, she was basically making the calls on some incredibly important subject matter areas and then the court's composition changes and um, uh, you know, turns out. Um, so fewer, ca fewer case decisions, how about culture? But, but, um, but I, I think notwithstanding, I mean, I, mean, I guess, I, I mean the reason I have such enormous respect for Justice O'Connor is, so she was in this sort of unique situation where she was making the calls on pretty much every important decision that came to the court. And in our country, most of the important decisions in the country come to the court in some way. Um, and if you said that to somebody, um, like all the important decisions are going to come to this one court and then there's going to be this one person who just so happens to kind of be in the middle of the court who is going to decide it. I mean, somebody would say, well, that's the craziest constitutional system ever. <laughs> like, why would you have a system like that? And the thing about Justice O'Connor, I feel, is that um, she made it work. Like, she made it work because she had an incredibly good understanding of the American people, and she had an incredibly good understanding of the, of the nation and what, it, what the American experiment meant. And she was probably not the justice who had the most sophisticated um, set of ideas about you know, judicial methodology or anything like that, but she was a person who really got um, what the court could do and what it shouldn't do, mm -hmm. and who really, um, who, who was able to sort of chart a path where people thought, you know, th those outcomes, they're probably the right outcomes. Um, uh, and you know, she, I think she left the country you know, much better off than she found it. She left the court much stronger than she found it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what more can you ask of a justice than that? Yeah, no, I, I, um, I worked, in addition to Justice Scalia, I worked with Justice Powell and, and he was very similar to <laughs> Justice O'Connor. And, and one of the things that, uh, I'm not really asking you to comment on this, but it does seem to me a sad reality. There's no world in which a person like that gets on the court today. There's just, there's, that world doesn't exist where someone either doesn't have opinions about law, Justice Powell, he was just a lawyer, hadn't thought about any of this stuff. And Justice O'Connor had been a judge, but she hadn't charted out where she was on those things. And um, it does seem like a loss not to have people like that on the collegial court. Uh, happily, we do have them on the courts of appeals for what it's worth. So, <laughs> you know, there, there are plenty of them out there, but um, the selection process has gotten so intense, you have to, so, but you, you, none of your answer about Justice O'Connor has to do with it being first. And I guess you would say that's, is that because that's now irrelevant? We don't need to talk about that anymore? I think that's sort of extraordinary. I mean, she gets on the court and, <laughs> and she is the first and um, she hadn't had the background that some of the, her colleagues had had and I'm sure that there was a lot of skepticism. And then it turned out, you know, she could do the job better than, uh, <laughs> so she showed them. Well, she, she, was a, um, she was a great questioner. She never hid the ball. She usually, st she was she usually, usually started things off. Started right? things off so you knew where to look as an advocate and um, it was always straightforward. She, the visual cues were v usually quite clear whether she liked the answer or not. And uh, <laughs> what did she do? 
she was not afraid to frown. I mean, I'm not uh -huh. saying it was a mean frown, but it wasn't a smile. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it was good. I mean, you, you said with Justice Scalia, the downside is he didn't let you do more than one sentence. The upside is you knew where he was coming from, and then he listened when you gave your answer. And she was clearly, and of course, everyone was listening to her question. So then you'd have a lot of reverberation from that question. Well, Justice Kagan, um, the country is so lucky to have you as a justice. And you know, the fact that you chose on the day of one of your, the biggest cases of well, the I didn't term, really choose it. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Everything's a choice. You, you easily could have said no. And um, I arrived even up to 315. I wondered how this was going to go. And you put a smile on your face and came over here. And I just well, have Judge to Judge Sutton, the country is lucky to have you as a judge. Judge Sutton no, is an no. esteemed no. Court of Appeals judge and a great chief judge now. Really? And um, so thank you for being the person We're who sits in the other chair. Well, well, thank you so much for doing this, and, um, and thank you for your leadership on the court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.